One of the kind of big inflationary narratives, though, from this recent period of the cost of living crisis has been around this idea of greedflation. The idea that the rise in prices is due to businesses putting up their costs and then using that to increase their profit margin when it is unnecessary for them to do so based upon their existing margins. Them putting prices up is what is causing the inflation because they're being greedy. Now, I was pretty sceptical of this narrative recently in the when you look at, say, for example, food retail, the margins are razor thin. So any input costs into the economy are naturally going to raise prices overall. Energy and food are our biggest increased prices. And that is what's led to a lot of the previous inflationary pressures. This is what's called cost push inflation. To quickly understand how that works, inflation is always going to be some kind of equilibrium point between supply and demand, like the level of what the price level is. So if demand massively increases, supply prices will come to meet that demand if the supply itself doesn't change. If the cost of inputs goes up, the actual overall amount of economic activity will go down because the same amount of money, as far as demand is concerned, can now buy fewer goods because the prices have gone up because the cost has inflated. And that's what we've seen over the past couple of years. We've seen cost push inflation. The increased energy prices, increase in food prices because energy goes into basically every single cost that we have. Energy is like patient zero. The inflationary crisis has had a house of cards style effect on the economy. It's propagated through everything because no matter whether it's a service or a product or a commodity, no matter what it is, those prices have all been increased by the increased cost of energy. Now, what that means is, is that you can't cool demand. The Bank of England puts up interest rates so that money is more expensive to borrow. So there's less demand in the economy, especially if mortgage rates go up and you have less expendable income. That shrinks demand down. And theoretically, if in a normal inflationary period where there's too much money, too much money chasing too few goods can lead to an inflationary pressures, which is why you'd increase interest rates to reduce the demand. That's not the case. As we've seen, the cost is what's increased moving forward. So I was sceptical of the greedflation narrative to begin with, because I think that what was going to happen is we have a stagflationary period where growth gets hit because we're not in a hot economy with high demand, but prices are increasing, reducing economic inactivity. That's going to stagflate the economy. You have to wait for everybody to get used to the new prices when given the increased price and all the incre increase in price in food. So that's an important preface to this segment here. I think that now the greedflation narrative is 100% correct. What has happened is that oil prices have gone down, gas prices have gone down, the overall wholesale price of energy has gone down, but prices remain high. We're not going to deflate our economy. One thing that you'll see in kind of a Keynesian style economy is that prices will never deflate. Deflationary economies are in generally really, really bad because once prices start deflating, people stop spending money because the longer you wait, the more things you can buy because prices are going down. The deflationary economies are just a kind of net negative in the kind of modern economy. So you don't want prices to deflate and neither do corporations. They want to continue getting you to spend as much money as possible. So as their input prices have gone down, they've kept their output prices the same. They're still higher than they were two years ago by the cumulative inflationary pressures of that two-year period. So what's happened? Wages haven't massively gone up. Prices have stayed the same. The input costs have gone down. The companies are just having massive windfall profits off of everybody getting used to the new prices and because they don't want to deflate their prices and deflate their economy and hit their overall margin on the, the products and the commodities and the services that they sell. So I think that it is absolutely correct that greedflation is what's driving the issues we have with cost of living at the moment. And the IMF agrees. It was kind of a big story. There's a big story that the International Monetary Fund, you know, the woke IMF, that institution that debt traps nations in the global south, forcing them to neoliberalise their economy, or at least they did, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. They've said that greedflation is a thing and that corporate profits are is what's driving inflationary pressures. And there was a lot of kind of poo-pooing of that narrative from a bunch of people in the right-wing press. And it's clear that up until this point, the Bank of England haven't agreed because they've raised rates, right? They've tried to get people not to get pay rises. In fact, yeah, there were high-profile economists at the Bank of England saying that we should, the workers should not be chasing higher wages unless they cause a wage price spiral. They've been telling us they have to depress wages through rate rises and through asking for pay restraint. And now they've U-turned. The Bank of England have now U-turned. And the Bank of England admits that greedflation is a thing. Work by their own analysts suggests that firms are intending to keep prices high despite falling costs. A rebound in corporate profit margins over the next year could prevent inflation falling as quickly as the Bank of England is expecting. That's not the conclusion of a leftist think tank or trade union. It's a clear message from the central bank itself, more precisely from a group of its in-house economists who's published research and examines how a wide spectrum of business plans to cope over the next few months and into 2024. The data is stark. According to the research, 45% of companies surveyed say they plan to increase their profit margins in the coming 12 months. Almost a third expect no material change to margins, but only 23% expect to suffer a fall. 
So this is this is blowing the entire Bank of England narrative for the last 12 months completely out the water. They were 100% incorrect. They've shown us that, that demand isn't driving inflation. And in fact, I have proof that demand isn't driving inflation because the record amount of savings have been drawn from people's savings accounts. And this was, this was back in May, right? So one when inflation was really uh, troublesome, or at least inflationary pressures were really troublesome, people aren't having loads of extra money to be able to spend. There's not loads of extra money in people's pockets that's chasing too few goods. They are, instead of taking place in their normal economic activity, which would be spending some money, saving some money, investing some money, they're now having to stop saving and take our money out of their savings to be able to afford to live. Because what calculates the amount of demand in the economy is also about changing economic activity rather than just how much money is in people's hands. Because if you can't afford to live off of your wages, you're either going to have to take on credit, you're going to have to reduce your living standards, or you're going to dip into your savings. And this massive reduction in savings in the UK, this withdrawal of savings from UK bank accounts, shows that it's demand chasing prices. Prices increase, people may take money out of their savings. That doesn't happen if you have a hot economy. That's a really important point to notice there. But this just shows there wasn't high demand, there was no need to continue raising rates, there was no need to ask for pay restraint. If companies are making bumper profits, and even the IMF said this as well, the IMF said that there should be wiggle room given by corporations, given their large profits, to stop putting profit first and to allow for wage rises so that the money is going back into the economy for people to spend to alleviate the cost of living crisis. The problem is, of course, is that why on earth would the companies do this? Why would any capitalist firm put the interests of workers over the interests of the bourgeois who are their shareholders? They have a fiduciary responsibility to maximise shareholder dividends. They have no moral inclination to want to help fix the cost of living crisis for the workers who work in their company. They have no material interest in doing so. The IMF pleading with companies to pay their workers more is identical to Jeremy Hunt pleading with shops to stop raising the price of food. You're asking somebody to just completely ignore their own material interests under the framework of capitalism. So of course, if you want higher wages, you've got to fight for them, which means joining a union. Friends at home, of course, you should join a union. Join a union. And then get, uh, tell your friends to join unions, tell your workmates to join unions and fight for higher pay. Because otherwise, there's no other mechanism that we have for ensuring that these bumper corporate profits go back into the hands of working people. You can't beg for a pay rise and never give it to you. You have to bargain for a pay rise. You have to show that you mean business. It's as simple as that. And we now have the stats to prove it. And it's not just, again, woke lefty think tanks. It's the IMF and the Bank of England. And this just shows a catastrophic failure from the Monetary Policy Committee that they've continued to raise rates despite there being no, no data that shows that they should be doing it. Then it shows a failure of the Bank of Independence Act as it's set up under Tony Blair that the Bank of England is forced to use monetary policy to try and cool inflation down to 2%, regardless of whether or not that monetary policy has any actual effect on the overall rate of inflation. They are forced by their own obligations within Bank of England Independence Act to use monetary policy even when it's not necessary to do so, because they have this specific target of 2% inflation. The Labour Party should ban fiduciary imperative. What we need to do is definitely have a more cooperative economy. We need to have workers on corporate boards. We need to have inclusive ownership funds moving the share portfolio into the people who work at the company. If you have, for example, a company that has over 50% worker equity, so the workers themselves have the, the final majority share in the company itself, there can be no greedflation. Because any greedflation is going into increasing the asset values owned by the people who work at the company and dividends being paid out to the people who work, and work at the company. And they also have de facto veto on any policy that would affect the interest of the workers who work at the company. Of course, the answer is always socialism, because welcome to the No Justice stream. But it's just so stark when you look at the differences, right? Another thing when you look at greedflation and you look at the increase in the cost of food in this country, when it's almost always in this country being owned by capitalist corporate international businesses who deal with a lot of our grocery retail. You look at Norway instead. Norway's grocery retail is 40% cooperatively owned, i.e. consumer cooperatives. So the, the consumers themselves own the cooperatives, so they have no vested interests in doing greedflation. They would want to minimise margins as much as possible. And that's why Norway's food inflation was only 7% a couple of months back, whilst ours was 19%. Because there's no greedflation factoring into it at all. So again, this is just a traumatic failure of the Bank of England, of economists, of the entire right wing at this point, really, or the neoliberals, for having an outdated understanding of inflation. You know, Milton Friedman didn't think that cost push inflation was a thing. You know, Milton Friedman didn't thought that inflation was always, always a monetary phenomenon. And this, is, this shows that this isn't true. The necessity of things like oil and gas means that there is always the, the, the potential for cost push inflation to hit economies in the way that it has ours over the last two years. 
And also, another thing this shows is why we need a Green New Deal. It's why we need a Green New Deal. It's why we need investment in our energy security by having homegrown renewable energy so that we avoid these kind of cost push inflation in future, so that we create new green jobs for people, state-owned, right? State-owned green energy companies paying good unionized public sector wages to these people. We have an industrial strategy that builds growth into our economy. Um, it's also why we need to have better union laws so it's much easier to be able to bargain with your employer so that these corporate profits are not so profligate. There's a reason why in place, countries like Norway and Denmark Sweden, where they don't have minimum wage laws, but what they do have is more better collective bargaining and sectoral bargaining agreements, so that minimum wages are set sector by sector through a consortium of trades unions negotiating with a consortium of businesses. And that's why the ratio of worker pay to CEO pay is much smaller in Nordic countries than it is here. Because the way we really set wages in this country, outside of the very few workplaces that are unionised, is just an individual negotiation between employer and employee. And that's why we have a gigantic wealth and, and sorry, a gigantic pay gap in this country between CEOs and workers 200 times on average and why the nordic countries are much more equal much better and have much stronger economies as we do as well and don't have as much inflationary pressure will labor back the unions they've abandoned when in power if not what's the difference like less crazy ministers well i fully believe that labor have abandoned the unions now i mean you look at the portland stuff that um alistair campbell was sending out saying they want businesses to lobby mps so she's saying please lobby my mps was what alistair campbell was saying but she was wanting to crowd in the private sector into forming policy she's getting into bed with the bourgeois. There is no resolving the inherent and unmovable contradiction of capitalism, which is the competing interest of both sides of the division of labour. And the Labour Party have decided that they're happy to stand with the bourgeois. What do the unions do when the party that's supposed to represent them is in bed with the people who the unions are there to fight against? They're not there to work with employers. They work there to work against employers. This is a combative relationship. And even the article backs me up on this. Questions about profits have formed part of a researcher's questionnaire only since May this year. Impressive, they also may examine the respondent's annual account as far back as 2005. The governor has urged workers on many occasions to forego wage rises to help prevent inflationary pressures on companies, and that has no basis in fact. No basis in fact. So the Bank of England was literally telling people, you will get poorer and you will like it at the expense of companies' profits. That's what the Bank of England was telling you up until now. And they have to have to do a humiliating climb down on something the IMF spotted months ago. 21st century capitalism is not anything but mechanical. Firms set prices based on what they can get away with in markets where there is restricted competition and where brands have leverage with consumers. Hmm. It turns out that the that the praxeologists were indeed wrong, and you can't just imagine the economy as a bunch of frictionless objects in a vacuum. Huh. How strange. Turns out the Keynesians were right yet again, as they always are and as we always have been. Right. Unites General Secretary Sharon Graham, who has accused Bailey of ignoring the impact of profiteering in his TV appearances and speeches, says the bank's research supports the union's own detailed critique. Unite has shown how the big supermarkets have rebuilt their margins since the years of intense competition before the pandemic, and also illustrated how other large companies, including Nestle and Procter & Gamble, have sailed through the cost of living crisis almost untapped. After two years of being ignored by the policymakers, she can have the last word. Ever since the greedflation crisis began, the Bank of England has been attacking workers' wages while downplaying corporate profiteering. Now the central bank's own analysis supports what Unite has argued all along about inflation. Companies are raising prices simply to boost their own profit margins. Based Sharon Graham, for once. For once, Sharon Graham is on the right side of history on this one. <laughs> and it's interesting that they point out specifically, you know, fucking neoliberalism. I missed the last few streams working away on the internet was shite. I do enjoy your streams. I believe you are now famous. Thank you very much for the £20 film of Kraken. Much appreciate for the support, as always. I always love your contributions on the channel. Thank you very much and appreciate the support. Uh, and good to have you in the chat as well. And hopefully I am going to be famous, fingers crossed. You know, I don't even, I think, I don't even want to be famous. I just want to be able to make a living off of the stuff I do, the entertainment that I provide on Twitch and YouTube for people and the insight that I give on something as important as the state of the country right now for working people. Like, it's interesting that they specifically point at people like Nestle and Procter and & Gamble. And it's the power that corporations have over our economy, the nature in which all corporations basically plan our economy because they have their fingers in so many pies and they own so much of our economic output that they can control how the inputs and the output prices work. Richard Wolf does really good stuff about this where corporations are so large, they have so much control over our economy, they've essentially created a planned economy using the same kind of methods that you know, Goss plan would have used in the Soviet Union to be able to plan how they shape the economy. And so they know as long as they keep 
keep union activity down and quashed through their friends in the media, they can always plan to keep all of the profit for their own shareholder dividends and not see the, any of the share of the productive output of this country actually go to work in people. And that's what's an issue, right? There may be some kind of perfect capitalism where there's perfect competition and prices never really go as far as they need to. Well, that will never happen in what should be a rightfully democratic society, where we have a government, we have a state, we have democracy who can change the, the fabric of the economy based upon competing interests. That's the, that's the, the again, another contradiction of capitalism is it's intimately tied to the state. Any capitalist who tells you that capitalism can function without the state, it's lying to you. They're completely lying to you. It's it completely dependent on the state shaping the way in which the economy function shaping the way in which we protect property rights because that's something that is completely um one of the prerequisites for capitalism is staunch to belief in property rights and when you have that there is always a way for nefarious interests to control the state for their interests that's the failure the failure of neoliberal capitalism so we have a corporate corporatocracy um investor state dispute settlements bilateral investment treaties all of these things where corporations can exert their power against elected governments against democracy and it subverts democracy and it shapes our economies in the needs of the super rich and the needs of corporations right and you can't just fix this by trying to reform capitalism you have to break it down you have to destroy it so uh yeah pretty bleak pretty bleak analysis there about the level of power of businesses in the economy but there is a way out it's joining a union if you enjoyed this video please do consider liking and subscribing it does help out the channel and the algorithm and if you click the bell notification icon it will let you know when i go live and when i upload videos if you'd like to follow me on social media my handle is at nojusticemtg and that is twitter tiktok facebook instagram twitch and youtube if you want to support my channel in a more financial manner, you can do so by becoming a member for just 99p, by super chatting, or by supporting me on Patreon, with the link is in the description of this video, and hopefully I'll catch you on the next segment.